Yeah, uh, that's got to be it. Think we're, yeah. think we're back. All right. We are took a trip back in time um, using Skype once again because we couldn't get Zoom to give us our side-by-side feature, and we got a lot of crap for that <laughs> last <laughs> week. Um, so positive we, feedback. It was it's good to get feedback. Constructive. Constructive. Yeah, constructive. constructive. Maybe not so positive, but constructive. Yeah, we took 20 minutes trying to get Zoom to work right. Uh, I'll have to Google the hell out of it for the next one because it, it gives us better quality. But you know what, man? So. I've been hearing about Zoom. It's catching a lot of crap right now uh, uh, because it's everyone's using it. And I'll get back to it. Sorry. Welcome to Over 50 starting over. Harry <laughs> Edwards. And I'm Merle Garrison. <laughs> yeah. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, so just briefly... So everyone's using it right now. I never heard so much about Zoom in my life until this, these last couple of weeks. Right. And it's apparently incredibly easy to hijack. So, and it's easy to uh, put malware on and overtake your camera. And, uh, and people are, they call it Zoom bombing meetings. I thought this was funny. I heard this on a podcast that apparently a couple of people were doing a podcast like this. And all of a sudden a third person comes on doesn't say anything. We're in a devil's mask and <laughs> doesn't say anything and just sits there. How weird is that? I, I saw one on the news just the other day where they were they were having a business meeting and then all of a sudden this this family pops on and they're just all like the kids and everything and they're in the middle of this big meeting. It's just crazy. I, I mean, the age of technology. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Business meetings and stuff. Uh, well, at least, at least there's entertainment happening here. There you the go. Place. Right. I mean, how bad can it get? Uh, so uh, we have a, a ton to talk about, and we have another show to do after this. So we are going to be a little bit rushed, but got a lot of good things. And I wanted to give a shout out. I mentioned my client, Dr. Claudia Minadio Fox, before her dentistry practice. It's a holistic dentistry practice. It's healthinspireddentistry.com. And we've been working out a whole content marketing plan that we are implementing. I started today, as a matter of fact. And I, I bring it up because I think this is worthy to talk about and share with people during this time, because I did this proposal a few months ago. I actually wrote the proposal for a three month plan back in December. Mm -hmm. And interesting that we're revisiting it now as we are just about to peak with the coronavirus. And so we did a zoom meeting yesterday and I got to tell you, it was about an hour and a half long meeting, at least a lot of personal BS in and stuff, but it was the highlight of my whole isolation period because I just, oh my God, I'm doing something purpose, purposeful and uh, creative and fun. It's good to see my clients. I work out of a home office. So seeing my clients and going to the gym, I always talk about our highlights of my day and my week. So this was really, really good. And it made me it enlightened me to a lot of things uh, about how a dental practice, she's like, man, I am on these webinars. My, she goes, my schedule, I, I have it packed just with all these different seminar webinars, online uh, seminars that are by the ADA, American Dental Association, and related things about legal stuff about how we're going to move forward as we emerge from this. This year is going to be really weird when you're talking about a uh, medical practice like this. She's saying that there are going to be a lot fewer patients in that office at a time, and they're going to have to wait in their car. Most likely, we'll have to wait in their cars until they are tested with one of those forehead thermometers uh. that they don't have. A, yeah. Yeah. So until we have a vaccine, it's going to be pretty weird for a while. But highlight uh, of yesterday was around here. The news is that we are peaking earlier than we thought, even just two days ago, peaking with way less deaths than predicted. It was a hundred to 200,000 a couple of days ago. Now it's like 60,000 the new prediction. So kind of thought this would be happening. I, I want to finish up about the content marketing plan. So it's still being implemented um, uh, along the lines, the framework that I had suggested, but man, now 
bringing that personal brand of the holistic angle to things, a very personalized approach is more important than ever because of what's going on. This is what I want to share is that with our listeners who have their own businesses that are trying to do their own content, struggling during this time, everybody's always struggling, but you have got to think about right now what you're saying to reconnect on a personal level with them and reassure uh, at, uh, to calm the fe any fears or anxieties about what's going on right now. Tell people, let people know via Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, whatever your channels of preference are. Let them know what your procedures, as you know them, as you become aware of them, what they're going to be like as we move forward. So it's very important. So I think that if you've been struggling with what your content should be and could be, right now I think it's about uh, – planning for your future, uh, what, your, uh, what your practice will look like, how it will evolve as a result of this. But reconnect, for God's sakes, make it personal. What we're starting with, Merle, we're starting off where I just sent her the script. For, this is another good tip for you guys out there. So we got a practice of about uh, five people involved over there, uh, dental techs and hygienists and massage therapists, the, the people like that. And we're having them create personal videos to post to the Facebook page where we have a very engaged, great audience. But uh, hey, what is, what is your name and your position? Uh, but what is the favorite part of your day? What are you missing the most as we've been in quarantine? Make it fun. Uh, and trying to remember what I wrote off the top of my head, uh, but maybe share a piece of advice of reassurance as to how we are taking uh, sanitization to a whole new level as we move forward, again, to ally those fears, to calm the fears. So yeah. and that kind of thing is very important. Again, it is going to enhance the personalized relationship and also give much needed uh, feedback and advice. And then we're going to repost those in the following week just to, uh, again, continue to maximize uh, the extent of that. And I just want to ask you for a quick update. I have something else I want to get into too, but you've been interviewing and stuff. I think it's, if you want to give an update, if anything uh, new has transpired. Well, I just want to say I, I, I had a uh, recent interview over Zoom myself. Nobody Zoom bombed us during that, unfortunately, because that would have been pretty fun. <laughs> would have been a great talking point. The guy right with there. the devil mask. Not yeah, saying that would have been that would have been a story to tell for generations, actually. But uh, I got to say, you know, it's a, I've been having a really good time doing it. And it was fun that we had a, a this was my first Zoom interview that I had. And the, the cool thing was, is that uh, the person that interviewed me had actually seen one of our shows before he came on. And he told me that he, he felt like he knew me already before the, the interview started. So making good progress along those lines and uh, enjoying the process, as I talked about before, the, the important thing is just, you know, relaxing and being yourself and just, you know, the, the, I think the important thing here is this, is that. When you're looking for a new position, you don't want them to hire the guy you're pretending to be. And you don't want a job that uh, is, is a job where you have to act like somebody else. You want to be able to come into that position feeling very comfortable about yourself because it's not all about getting the job. It's all about the job that you're going to be successful at, that you feel comfortable about being yourself. One of the things I've learned is that as a salesperson, you know, uh, the best that you can be out there in front of the client is when you're just being yourself. And that's yeah. the best I can be. I can only be myself. So thanks for giving me a, a chance to, to update that. But I wanted to get back to you on the, the dental piece mm. uh, with your client, because I know that during this time, as we're all at home, there's a lot of fear, as you mentioned earlier, about going to the dentist because sure. of just, you know, this whole virus that's going on and everything. Sure. And um, here, yeah. let me put these things in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think the sanitation that, has got to be at a whole new level. I, I wonder if the, if you had a chance to talk to your client about, you know, some things don't have to be done uh, in yes. the chair. 
You're right. She is. Uh, they talked about there's a whole new standard that they're going to be implementing for doing uh, online consultations. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty point. interesting. And I think that, you know, if you're sitting at home right now, it'd be pretty easy to, hey, I've got uh, I've got a, a pain right here. I don't want to go to the dentist, but I want to be able to talk to my dentist and hopefully they could give me a sense of comfort and, and the, without me having to come into the office. Right. No, absolutely. So they are implementing that. And I just wanted to say that uh, Lisa has begun developing a relationship with her. She's uh, Lisa's one of those people that needs a lot of dental stuff. Some people do, some don't. I go to a cleaning once a year and I'm done. Um, but Lisa's gotten to the point she's now like, well, I'm going to tell my uh, hypnotherapist about this, or my yoga instructor and um, an energy worker, all these kind of people. These, these ladies love this kind of holistic approach to it. So, I, you know, I guess I wanted to make a point uh, to your point about your interviewing and just keep putting one step in front of the other. I, most well, of my clients, most of my clients have just stopped and now, I got the, the law firm. I have just an absolutely terrific family-owned law firm that I love so much. And they've, they've stopped. I'm going to reach back out to them because I think that they, for one, are probably uh, have a lot, of feed, uh, a lot of information they can tell some of us business owners about what's going on, what, what are concerns, uh, perhaps liabilities that we may need to think about that we never thought about before. So I got to reach back out to them. But it's also a perfect time for us to wrap up the entire uh, rebrand that I've been working on for them, and, they, and they've stopped there. I, so I'm, it's time to keep putting one foot in front of the other because we're almost on the other side of the most horrific part of this. And you're going to regret that you didn't use this time wisely if you don't don't uh, implement some things right now. You know, that's such good advice, Barry. And in fact, I have it written down in front of me, um, live in the moment. Mm. Um, you know, it, during this time, it's so easy. I, I've had a few mornings where I've, I've awakened and I felt depressed. And I felt like, yeah. you know, I, I, I typically can hear traffic outside because I live on a busy road, but sure. now I don't hear anything out there. And I think, when is this going to be over? I mean, come <laughs> I want to hear traffic. I, you know, I don't really want to hear traffic, but it's, but I, it means everything is shut down. And, yeah. and so then I think, you know, maybe there's some good news uh, about this whole virus thing. And I pick up my phone and I look at it, you know, I get like a feed you know, from different resources and, and it's never good news. You know, it's, it's like, what you, you really have to look for good news in yeah. order to find it. And, and so you, that's, that's definitely not something I should be relying on to make myself feel better. But one of the things that, um, I realized that I was doing was I was projecting into the future and what's going to happen, you know, as I'm on this job search and everything, I'm thinking about what's going to happen with this or what's going to happen with that. And I start to get this foreboding feeling and everything. I was talking to my brother about this and he's a pretty wise guy. He is. He's a, he's wise, a wise guy. guy too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, he's, got, he's, he's, definitely, got wisdom. he's definitely got yes. wisdom and he was talking about living in the moment and how you can be, you can be happy in the moment. Look around you, look at what's, what's happening right now. And I, I started really focusing on that. Like, Hey, look, look around what I have. I, I have a great life right this moment. I'm healthy. I I'm, I'm here with my wife and my house. I I've got food in the refrigerator. I, I, I but it's warm Three years <laughs> worth of toilet paper. Yeah, I've got, I've got running water and electricity and I've got my computer and my, my cell phone and internet. I can talk to other people anytime I can come on this show with you. Um, in the moment, everything is great. And I think that's something it's, it's a tip for me, at least I just wanted to share that, uh, to live by. I, I, th I think so, you know, uh, to let, let tomorrow happen, let tomorrow be, I, I, I was reading this, uh, devotion that was talking about how, um, God is going to help you with whatever problems come up tomorrow. Don't even worry about that. Focus on what's happening today. You know, in the Bible, uh, God calls himself the name I am. 
not yeah. I will be or I was. He's the God of the present right now, and he's going to help you with whatever you got going on. So I, I just think as we're going through this, you talked about peak. Uh, you know, we're coming up to our peak and everything, and I'm seeing numbers. I had to search for them, but I'm seeing numbers that are supporting that. That we're 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 looking like we're on the on the back end of this, or at least about to be on the back end of this. So I think that's uh, pretty good news. Yeah, that's that's really good news. So I love what you're talking about because it really uh, segues right into what I want to talk about. And it's inspirational. And we talk about this from time to time. Anxiety is being mentally stuck in the past or in the future. Yes. And if you're in the present and your life is not being threatened right now, you're just fine. All right. right. <laughs> Ask yourself at this very second, are you, you're just fine. And if you could string along a lot of those moments, that's what meditation is uh, for a large part. And you're going to build more and more gaps of the, of these hap, this happiness. So it's really good. So, you know, I like to, when I'm winding up the second half of my workout, I like to find an inspirational video or something. This is a video uh, that I've been watching and listening to for about five or six times now. And it's really heavy, but it's so impactful. It's why I keep listening to it because I want it to become crystal clear to me consciously so I can then live it unconsciously. It's, and it really, I'll tell you, I'm going to try to simplify it. And then I really want to encourage you all to uh, take it in for yourself so you can listen to this psychologist explain in very uh, psychological terms, really, about how the power of manifestation works, the secret, that kind of, the secret we got so excited about that about 15, 20 years ago because it sounded like a magic bullet. And, well, are we all millionaires right now? No, we're not. You know why we're not? Because we didn't get clear with, ourself on, with ourselves on some things. We didn't change some habits, and we, and we didn't really capture the power, the control that we can have over our thinking. And this is what I wanted to tell you about how he explains it. Now, first of all, it is called learn how to control your mind. Use this to un to brainwash yourself. And it's by Fearless Soul. So you could type that into YouTube. It'll come right up. But I'll also put the link in the show notes. So you can just go to over50startingover.com, look up our video, or go to our YouTube channel at Over 50 Starting Over. And please, people, like and share our stuff. Comment, engage with us. We've had this kind of recurring thing, Merle and I have noticed that virtually on a daily basis, we're being asked to do things for people on our show. And but are you know are you engaging with us are you becoming a friend of the show are you uh bringing uh, certain topics meaning comments bringing that up uh, enhancing the conversation are you sharing our stuff you know if you're going to ask us to advertise on the show or even come on you got to bring you got to become a friend of the show so help us out a little bit we want to spread this message now on to what this is all about all right. Oh, so this is Dr. Joe Dispenza, and he starts out talking about the mental, mental patterns that we start uh, reawakening upon waking up in the morning. And so we wake up, we're usually pretty good. And, and I go, and we, we, and we start our habits. I go downstairs. I pretty much usually have my coffee preset, but I make my coffee. I come back with my coffee and I'm watching some uh, morning news, sipping my coffee, whatever it may be at that, at that given morning. But I do notice some mornings worse than others, my mental patterns start going back to kind of habitual kind of stuff. Then we go take our shower, we go through rush hour traffic or whatever our habits may be. But they are, um, they are learned experiences. And what happens is we start feeling certain feelings. So he'll talk about Maybe something happened that you would consider traumatic at a point in your life that you never really resolved. But and let's just take something as simple as you lost a really big sale, okay? But 
you felt that you lost it because you blew it somehow. Maybe you even mm. felt humiliated in a, in a big meeting amongst your coworkers. Something, you know, like that. That would be kind of traumatic. And maybe that made you shy away from certain environments and situations. And so it's adversely affected you. So it, there's many, many, many examples like that that we can pick out of our past, stuck in the past. Remember right. what we just said? Right. Uh, that we then process each morning and start running that particular program like a computer program. That is what we're running all day long and is guiding us forward. And so what happens is your body, your, okay, so you're feeling these feelings. Your body reacts to that because when you're feeling horrible feelings, you're going down this road, your body wants to get away from it. It is uncomfortable. It, it sucks. And we are programmed primarily at one heightened level of looking to be safe. We want safety. We want, don't want to be uncomfortable. And so you do whatever you do to hide from those feelings, whatever they may be. And there's all kinds of habits and addictions and different things that we hide behind. So what he's, he's t saying is your body becomes control, the control. Not your mind. Your body has become so conditioned that as you go through your habits throughout the day, it's feeling its feelings. So therefore, you want to do what you can to cope with those feelings. And then you start it all over the next day. So he says you got to understand if you want to change your body from take over uh, control from your body, get your mind back in control then you have to make some small changes that are uncomfortable at first when, because your body will go into its mode where it will feel anxiety again. And so you want to get back into your pattern of dealing with your anxiety. So it's discomfort is largely discomfort. It's getting out of your comfort zone. So give me an example of that. Uh, getting out of your comfort zone, meditation, yeah. Meditation. This is so that, where it comes back to. So when you tell your body to sit and behave and stop with the, the, the adrenaline that wants to run, the mind that is racing, you're training it like a dog and it doesn't listen at first. It's very uncomfortable. So we want it to stop. You can directly put this into your Christianity principles. Pray. Do extensive pray, and I want to say, Merle, that you you've never talked about we've never talked about this, but when you pray, and I find your prayers to be incredibly effective. You know, I've sought you out at very uh, timely times in my life that where I've needed it. You pray in a sense of gratitude. You don't say, "Please give me this," "Please give me that." You why don't you talk about that for a moment? Please. Mm, well, you know, it's interesting you're talking about this because when I pray, I don't I, it's I am amazed myself at the prayers that come out of me because I actually don't think about what I'm going to pray. Like you've come to me before, sure. what many people have, and they say, OK, I, I'm having this problem. And I say, let's pray about it. And then I, I open up my mouth and these prayers come out and I'm listening to them, but I don't feel like they're coming from me, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I feel like they are coming from God and that those are the prayers that are, are there from God himself, uh, not only for the person I'm praying for, but uh, sometimes I myself get blessed out of the prayer that's happening. I'm like, afterwards, I'm thinking, wow, that helped me. Yes. But you come from a... you. You come from a very results-oriented, thankful place of gratitude. Your prayers talk about, I want to thank you, God, for putting this in front of us and for showing, guiding us through this difficult time. Kind of, I'm talking generically because when you do it, you talk a little more specifically. But in, and you'll go on. You'll go on for three minutes, as you said. It's on autopilot, but it'll be all about the gratitude of coming out on the other side of this and being so much more blessed as a result. I think that's incredibly important because when we talk about manifesting things and when we talk about c taking control back from our body and getting it back for, to our mind, it is talking, it always comes back to envisioning what you want your future to truly look mm, like. Mm, mm -hmm. So 
you are yeah. already feeling the the thing is is you want to feel that what it feels like to be a live in abundance to be healthy to be in a state of gratitude when you start that's what the meditation is about as i said if you're christian double down on that and use your prayers in this very thankful way to feel these feelings of gratitude and what your life is envisioning, is shaping up to be in the future. And you will, things will happen along your day that yeah. will take you a step in that direction and people will pop up or you will meet who will help you get there. It is the same with meditation. So as he says, it's like training a dog. When you get your body to say, sit and stay, calm down, and then you can feed it some better food than what it's used to. It's one step at a time. It gets easier and easier. I've done so many different versions of this. I've mentioned that I sometimes, I'll go on the Stairmaster back in the old days when I could go to the gym and use the Stairmaster. Uh, I say Stairmaster. I like the elliptical, to be honest. Right, doesn't matter. Right. Sometimes I'll listen to uh, some YouTube channels of the certain frequency of meditation that is now I forget what it's called something beats and uh and just clear my mind see I like being on ellipt elliptical because people think well oh my god you're not meditating you're not sitting there still like some buddhist and not no I'm getting rid of that awful energy while I'm doing this and then I can calm my mind and free it up. But I will use these different uh, YouTube self-hypnosis things when I'm laying in bed often to help get me there as well. So what is, whatever it takes for you is fine. Just know that I, th I think that the whole concept of taking back control from your body, back to your mind, and feeding it the good stuff is important to know and understand. So this is why, uh, and I also wanted to mention that I, I've heard this so many times from so many different people. One of the most influential people of my life is Dr. Wayne Dyer, rest his soul, um, he, he would always take Buddhist principles and give them a Christian twist. Like his, what he would say for meditation would be, take the prayer, um, our Father who out thou, who out thou Harrow be, the, be thy name. Okay. Of course. Yeah. Could you say it? <laughs> our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There we go. Sorry about that. I used to do this <laughs> meditation a while ago. Okay, so just briefly, Buddhists would say, well, contemplate the Buddhist, the Buddhist statue. Maybe put the Buddhist statue in front of you. Then uh, when, you, when you concentrate on the gaps, uh, the negative space uh, in between areas of the sculpture, that is when you get some clarity, when you free up your mind or listen to your breath. Okay, forget the Buddhist sculpture gets a little too weird for people. Just sit there and only concentrate on your breath in and out. Only think about that. You know what? Your mind's going to race. It's okay. Don't, don't freak out. Gently put it back on track. Listen to your breath again. You'll get better at it. Oh, so Wayne Dyer would say, take the uh, Our Father Who Out Thou thing and picture those letters in your mind. Okay. Our Father, O U. Uh, picture the gap in between the O and the U. That is when you get to a point where your mind is susceptible to it's completely clear when you can concentrate on you. You're concentrating on this visual imagination. When you got it where you want it, go to the next letter, O U. Okay, so U and the R. The gap in between the O and the, and the R. And he has a book called Getting Into the Gap where he teaches this. I, had, I read it many years ago, but it's really important. It's all on these lines. So this is a whatever it takes for you to meditate, to calm your mind, to calm the anxiety, and to get into the moment, into the gap. This is when you can when you get calm again, you could feed your mind what you want it to. Now visualize what it's like to achieve that success, whatever success means for you. And picture yourself in the moment. Maybe it's a car, all right? Picture yourself driving that car. Maybe it's accolades, fame. Maybe you love fame. Feel, feel that fame for a moment. Think about what it'd be like to be in the store 
and somebody recognizes you uh, for that achievement that you were looking forward to. It will change your day. When you get more of these into your day, it will become, you'll change the bad habits, the mental habits into good habits. And it will help you in manifesting your dreams. I like that. You know, I think visualization, as you were talking about Wayne Dreyer and <clears throat> and just being able to picture the, the gap, um, I think that's important as well. You know, I brought up Psalm 91 before and um, the, the first line is, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And um, I find myself actually going to sleep to that every night. And mm. what I do is, you know, because a lot of times at night, that's where, you know, the sometimes you'll get some fear feelings and things like that. But um, I start to really think about what is that saying to me? And I think about, I start to visualize the secret place where, what is the secret place like? And, and the almighty. And I, I picture myself in this very safe fortress where, you know, I, I start to think about my own family and growing up and, you know, being at my house during the holidays when my mom was cooking something that smelled really good and we were mm. having fellowship together and I was there with my dad. My dad was huge. He was like six, five and he was just a big man. And, you know, um, he had such a great uh, sense of humor and so gentle, but at the same time, he was like a big bear. That's your friend that is something tried to come and get you, you know, nothing could harm you there, mm. you know, and just picture yourself there in that secret place. It, you know, God is your heavenly father. So that's where you are in that secret place of the most high, no matter where you are, you abide in the shadow of the almighty. I thought about my childhood and how I would be somewhere with my dad in the, in the daytime. And he cast a big old shadow, you know, yeah. and I would be there in his shadow. And again, he was, it was like being in the shadow of a bear. That's your friend, you know, nothing's going to harm you there. Mm. And you just put yourself in that place and it, you're there all the time. According to God, no matter what the situation is, no matter how perilous it looks, uh, that's really what Psalm 91 is all about. And if you can live in that in that moment, no matter what moment it is, that's that's where your that's where the peace comes from. You know, uh, you talked about uh, my prayers, and I was just going to say one day I saw this picture, and it was a picture of President Kennedy, and he was sitting in the Oval Office at his desk, but underneath of the desk were his kids, John and, and Caroline, playing with toys while he was on the phone. And I, and I thought about, isn't that a great picture of like when we pray to our Heavenly Father that no matter what he's doing, you know, if one of those kids would have said, hey, Daddy, I need this, uh, he would have uh, – Hold off, uh, you know, he's talking to the, the prime minister of Russia or whatever, you know, hey, hang on a second. Uh, yeah, do you need that, sweetie pie? Let me get that for you, you know? <laughs> I mean, this is how God, the almighty, the all-powerful that he he's... You know, we're in the Easter season right now, mm -hmm. which is well, this is the biggest, uh, you know, holy week as a Christian has said mm -hmm. we're coming up on Good Friday tomorrow. That's when Christ himself as God went to the cross on my own behalf um, and sacrificed his own life in place of me. And if he would do that for me, what would he not do for me? If he would give the biggest thing he, that he has to me, what would he not give to me? Just like those kids underneath the President Kennedy. This is the most powerful man in the world. What would he not give to his kids? What, 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 what meeting would he not interrupt if one of his kids were in trouble? <clears throat> and just picturing that as you pray, that's what I always picture is that nice. I'm coming into the throne room of God and I'm there personally, just like those kids. And, you know, when I ask, I'm, I'm expecting that that's what Christian hope is, is mm -hmm. I'm expecting him to answer. He always answers. He never not answers. Boy, does that ever give you a sense of, 
a piece, especially during a time like this, as we're going through this, oh. this dark season that, yeah. you know, um, <clears throat> Hey, you know, we do live in perilous times. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at mm -hmm. your right hand, but it shall not come near you. You know, it also talks about angels that are given charge over you and that you're not just you, you're coming into a situation with your heavenly angels around you mm -hmm. that cause favor to happen all around mm -hmm. you. And, you know, I, I just think about that during this time as we're in, in the Easter season, uh, which is the greatest miracle in the Bible is that Christ raises from the dead, showing that everything he said about the promises that he gives to you are absolutely the truth and that we don't have anything to be afraid of. When he first appeared to the apostles, he said, fear not, the very first things. Boy, tell you what, it, it goes back to everything that we talked about, including the video. It, it Now, the video comes from a very psychological, clinical point of view, but when you get, I don't care how you get there. If to your point is if you can use your faith to take these burden, these perceived burdens off your shoulders mm. and hand them over to God and let yourself uh, be free of that anxiety and soak up the unconditional love that we're surrounded by in this universe, your life will get a lot better. Boy, you said a mouthful right there. I'll never forget when I, I first accepted the Lord into my life, man. I, I felt like I had a million pounds of weight on my shoulders. And, you know, I can't say that instantly everything was all better. But somehow I felt like this weight had at a been time. taken off of me that uh, you can't even really explain it. You can't even really explain it. But, you know, I mean, here we are. We're about halfway through the show right mm. now. A little oh, more than halfway. we are. We and are. Uh, I, I wanted to point out a couple of things. As I said, we're coming into the Easter season and, um, you know, families are going to be experiencing something very different this year. Typically, I get together with my family family and we have a big dinner and all, but that's really not going to happen this year. Um, here in Los Angeles, they have uh, even recommended that we don't even go to the supermarket, that we that we order uh, somebody to come and bring it to us. So uh, fortunately, uh, about a week and a half ago, I went shopping and I collected enough stuff for the next two weeks. So we're probably, Anne-Marie and I, we're probably just going to have spaghetti <laughs> for, for Easter dinner. That's going to be the new normal, I think, but sure. uh, I, I'm just grateful that we get to do that. And, uh, but I wanted to bring up, uh, some things that are happening around the neighborhood right now that are uh, very interesting. And one of them is that I've got this park, right? I wanted to get your opinion on this, Barry, cause I I've got this park right down the street. It's a really nice park. You know, it's got a swimming pool. It's got a recreation area. It's got baseball diamonds. There's a place you can kind of go hiking back there. And the uh, locals, uh, really, this is happening all over L.A., have decided to fence up the park, and they're moving the homeless into the park. Wow. And I saw that on the news. Yeah. And, and, they, and they outlined, painted outlines of yeah, they, yeah. like parking spaces and so and then they're gonna have uh the, see there's all these campers that are all around the area i guess people that have lost their homes have moved into these really terrible campers i mean they look mm. like they're from the 60s or 70s and they're gonna they're gonna move those into the parking lot and um you know the these um so that's what's gonna happen and um i kind of feel like you know, doesn't that, of course, we're concerned about the homeless and everything, but getting them all into one place, into close quarters, doesn't that set up sort of an incubation area there where they can easily spread it to one another? You would think. You know, this is a slippery slope right here because the their first priority is to get these undesirables all in one spot away from the taxpayers. All right. You know, that's what they're thinking. Uh, but then what they're doing is in some regards, I mean, these are the people that were fabricating uh, Trump's responsibility for putting kids in cages. That's, you know, started in the Obama administration. They were using pictures from right. Obama's administration mm -hmm. and, and uh, trying to show how, how cruel the other side is. So, 
I, it's a slippery slope. What do you do there? Cause on the one hand you got, you know, people that are using a much lessened form of, uh, hygiene and, uh, protection in this time. It sounds like, uh, unfortunately, it's the right thing to do, but at the same time, it sounds very cruel. And, but at this, you know, that's always the result with these policies. It's just like California lifts the whole, makes the law, you can live everywhere you want. Now you get, we, you and I take a, a bike ride down Santa Monica Beach, and it's just lined with these ugly ass campers that you're talking about, where these people are, have free beachfront property. Right, you know? right, exactly. Well, let this me throw is what, something else at you. Um, so, the as you you were saying, this is going to protect the people by getting people off of the street. But the park is in the middle of our neighborhood, so it's not really separating the people from us. It's actually bringing them much closer to us. And here's the thing I was thinking about: is that we have this thing here in the country about property rights. And when you buy a house, especially out here, houses are not cheap. They're the, <laughs> one of that's some of the most expensive property. Yes. And not to mention the tax rates out here are through the roof. And so you buy your house near a park, which should improve your property value. But now that you have really a contaminated area uh, next to your house, that's there goes your tax dollars at work and the the value that you've invested in your biggest investment now is taking a hit as well i mean yeah. do we have a right to protest that oh man you are uh throwing out the controversies today aren't you uh it's it's such a double edged sword uh what what is the answer? Do you scoop all these people up and ship them out into a field or valley in Idaho that's unpopulated? Uh, I, you know, um, there's a, a large mix of mentally ill people, other people that have just absolutely hit the skids with their career for various reasons, and a whole lot of drug addicts that have an illness. Yes. So what's fair to these people? I well, don't that, have that. It's that's such a good point that you're bringing up is the mental health aspect for two reasons. One is that um, we've made significant changes to uh, mental health care over the last couple of decades where we've really turned these people loose out on the streets. Oh, um, yeah. A, a big protest about how they used to handle mental health was that movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And yeah. that, that actually made a lot of changes. But what they did was they emptied those people out into the streets. Now they don't have access to the medication and they don't have access to the food, which becomes a burden on your neighborhood. And there, there uh, in lies the real problem, which is now you have mentally ill people that are roaming around your neighborhood. And when you put them into a, an area that's concentrated in your neighborhood, by the way, they're free to come and go as they please. They just have to stay there. Then now you have, you know, do you want your daughter walking around at night or, or, or whatever? You're paying a supreme dollar in order to live in this area. Um, and I brought up, do you have a right to protest this? Well, I have an app. I think you have the same one called Next Door. Mm -hmm. And I see this being debated on there. And people are, mm -hmm. are bringing up the fact that, hey, I paid for it. I pay for this. And, you know, I, I took my own personal responsibility and I work very hard. And all of a sudden, other people are making a choice that I don't seem to have any say in. And let's get together and protest on this. Well, the other side of this is other people, you know how you always say you read the comments, other people mm -hmm. are coming in and saying, shame on you. Oh, of course. For they saying are. that. And well, we should be giving our, 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 this is exactly what we should be doing right now. So here's the thing. You know, we have this thing called the First Amendment, which gives us the right to assemble. Now, isn't it interesting with this coronavirus that if you did want to assemble, would that be illegal? Would you not be practicing social distancing at that time? Mm -hmm. And what about these cities now that are imposing fines if you don't social distance up to $1,000? 
does that has that stolen our constitutional right to actually petition the government? Uh, though again, wow. Um, those though, I think it's going to be argued that you know this is a, a wartime state of wartime. They keep saying that, and during this time, we are. are giving our government the power to make some, what's the word, but some rather mm, quick decisions on our behalf without our say. Mm. And, you know, I don't want to say fascist or anything, but during times of war, we uh, rely and trust our government to, uh, to act quickly on our behalf. Now, we both know what happens there, like in 9-11, that what do they do? They use this as an opportunity to enact the Patriot Act, which spies on us in untold ways, and then they never repeal it. And so it will be very interesting going forward to see if we lose some freedoms here as a result, just to what you're talking about. But then, geez, man, there's so many implications about socialism as well. Now, I always have thought that as we evolve and continue to evolve, I don't think anybody should be going hungry in this country or not have access to water and even basic homes. And then you get into the whole theory about, well, then there's still social classes and all of that. Well, let's take it a step at a time. But I do know that when you Let's say if in California that the best of intention people are saying we need to give more of our income to these people that aren't working so we can provide better environments for them. What will automatically and very quickly happen is a lot of people will quit this rat race and just say, screw it, man, I can't take it anymore. I can live a bare minimum life off of these, off of this check I'm getting each month. Then what happens? Your taxpayer paying base continues to decrease and your dependence will continue to increase until it gets to be an unsustainable system. So, I mean, I'm finding this in the Heights. I, I, there, uh, I always call it little San Francisco out here. And I see the same, de- I read the same kind of debates on next door as well. It is interesting, but we have for years, our only solution is with our far left governments out here is every, the solution, every problem is a new tax. And we are always one tax increase away from being utopia. Always one. And, um, <laughs> And we have, as a result, for years now, seen a slow and steady decrease in the, ta- in, the, in the taxpayer base. So what's their solution? Well, we need to increase taxes. It's the same thing. So we have to find a way. We have to, we have to figure out where the tipping point is that we can continue to incentivize people to work, try hard, and, and contribute positively to our society while trying to take care of people that cannot and try to d- decide who is who. Well, I think that therein lies the problem, right? Is that um, there is a thing called personal responsibility. I yeah. know that uh, as I was growing up, that was drilled into my head all the time yes. by my father, especially. And and that as you take a look at these people and as you take a look at our government, you made a really good statement about, you know, during wartime, we're supposed to trust our government to make these quick decisions. But I I would pose to you, how can we trust our government Mm -hmm. when they keep making these same types of decisions to tax us? And then when we pay the higher tax, the the problem doesn't go away. We've actually had here in Los Angeles several taxes that have happened over the years that I've lived here to help out the homeless. And all I've seen is the homeless problem getting worse and worse. Where is that money actually going? And so why... Is this really wartime? I mean, we have an epidemic, but should we actually give the government power to make quick decisions without our say so on these types of things? I, I I shudder to think about how it's been used against us in the past, as you brought up the the nine eleven thing. But I I go back to this whole thing about the way America should work is that. Uh, or the way that it's all been laid out is that we have a voice as individuals here. And and yes, there are people that, that need help, 
but there are people that are also out there that actually don't need help. They just choose to be helped. And mm-hmm. how do you choose, how do you, how do you make a difference between those people? And really what has happened as an evolution here in our country is that the government has chosen to take the place of God. And as we talked about before in my prayers is in the throne room, when I'm praying, I imagine myself in the throne room, God has ultimate power to move on our behalf. But if the government steps in and decides, no, I'm the one that has all the power to move on your behalf, then they make these choices, but they're not all knowing. Um, they really don't have, and they're have all greedy, the power. they're greedy, man. And, and, and politicians they, are greedy. The, the, therein lies another big problem is that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's been a historical fact. So if we give our government the power to act in absolute authority, then what are we really expecting? Uh, it's uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. This is seemingly insanity. I'll pose one last thing to you, and that is, does this give us an opportunity to form a new way of activism in the face of these challenges that we have today, one of them being social media, and how do we, I mean, is this an opportunity to, as we keep talking about a new paradigm, if we can't all get together and march around with picket signs, Maybe there's an opportunity out here for somebody that's inspired with a great idea. What do you think? Oh, I man, you're you're just coming at at me with the intellectual questions here. Um, I think that's very very interesting. So, are you asking uh, in this new day and age where uh, everybody just discovered Zoom overnight and their social media and all that uh, that social media may actually be a positive answer instead of just a, a negative way to prey on each other? Maybe maybe the Zoom bomb can be used <laughs> as our <advantage. laughs> You know, I was thinking back when you were talking about, uh, at some point you mentioned JFK and you're like, and he's in this picture. And then you see under his desk, my head went immediately like, is he talking about Bill Clinton? Please don't. Uh, (laughs) 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 Hey, you know what? I don't, I, I want to get back to this as much as you want, but we are under a time constraint for sure today. We literally have nine to 10 minutes. I forgot to plug an article I just wrote this week for a client. Just take a second. But it's important to us small business owners. And it's about the Google, the basics of Google Analytics. And I have a client that's a church. Now, as you may well imagine, they have taken everything online. So their sermons and everything else, they are their their website and social media presence has become more important than ever so that they can still get in touch with their uh, congregation virtually. So they ask, so now they're con- c- creating more important content than ever. And they asked me, how, how can we tell if, if who is reading, watching our congregation videos and visiting these pages? And I just took the opportunity. It's like, okay, those are the basics, the very basics of your Google analytics. And they're so important. So if you're a small business owner and you're like, oh yeah, I create some content here and there. Well, creating valuable content is the way you market yourself today. Sharing it on social media, as we're talking about, generates interest. It uh, increases your relationship with your potential clients. And so you, if you... I have only six basics on this article. To find it, go to edwardscom.net and scroll to the very bottom. That's where you'll find my latest blog post. And so you can't miss it. These six steps, I talk about what you see on your homepage and you'll see your traffic for the week and uh, just certain hits, the very basics of what you want to know. Very interesting. Then I show you how to, and these are all with screen captures. So you can click on them and easily understand this. Then you come to your audience demographics. So you see male, female, age, uh, who is visiting your site. Then you go to user flow. Where are they going first? Did they land on a blog post first or your homepage? Where did they go after that? And then number four is acquisition. Where did they come from? Did they find you via Google search 
or did they find you via your Facebook page? You need to know this stuff. And uh, especially for your search engine optimization efforts. Number five is page views. This is where you very quickly and easily see what are your most popular pages. Now you know what is your most popular content and you can continue uh, to optimize uh, based on this feedback, number, and number six, the final one, is time spent. How much time are they spending on these particular pages? So when you put that together, you realize what, what is the best content that is ingested the most. And now when you're spending that important time creating that content, you know how to better do it for the audience that is most interested in you. So go ahead to edwardscom.net and take a look at that article, please. Very good, Barry. I like that. Hey, I wanted to ask you about uh, something that came up in the news this week about this. Uh, we're going back to COVID-19 and how they are categorizing COVID-19 deaths. And I don't know if you saw this or not in the news, but there is uh, some controversy that's happening right now. Uh, Britt Hume did a report on this and it's uh, people are all up in arms about this right now, but... What we're seeing and, and what uh, Deborah Burks, the uh, response coordinator for the uh, task force for the coronavirus, is saying is that if somebody uh, passes away, if somebody dies, it could be that they passed away because they had cancer, but they also had symptoms of coronavirus that the code that they're using for that actual death is the coronavirus code. And what we're seeing as a result is that an inflation in the number of coronavirus actual deaths that are being reported. What do you think about that whole thing? I mean, she actually came out and admitted that. No, I and I think they should admit it. It's once again, it's one of your controversies that you brought up here today. You're solving all the world's toughest problems. I'm here. not actually. I'm asking you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's, you know what? I guess I admire the fact that they came out and were forthright about that because otherwise it's pure manipulation. And, uh, and I, you know, what do you do with it if they actually die with the virus? And at what point do you say, well, did the virus p play a role in this or not? It's a tough one. I, I, I guess I just have to say, I'm happy that they came out with that instead of used it to overinflate numbers because, man, I'll tell you one thing. If there's one thing that I've always believed about the medical industry is that they will always over – like they did with this virus and you and I both – suspected this from the start, that they were overstating everything because they think we're too stupid to be able to simply be armed with the actual factual knowledge. So they got to scare you enough to stay in your house uh, as many people as possible. Now we have seen all those dumbass kids out on spring break and in, in, in a lot of instances of things like that. In New York, hey, we talked about it last week, different society altogether. But they needed to handle that uh, a lot more mm, seriously than they did. Um, so I'm just, my answer to that is double-edged sword. It's you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you don't stress the importance of this enough, there's so many stupid people in this country that we could have come out a lot worse. Well, um, go ahead. You and I saw a video and I passed it on to you. I passed it on to a few of my friends as well. And uh, the video actually was uh, pretty shocking, to be honest with you. And it was centered around New York and Los Angeles and the hospitals there. And first we were seeing news reports of the, the epidemic and how this is flooding hospitals and big lines outside of the hospitals. But then what we also saw was that it, people like you and I would take their iPhone and go over to the hospital the next day after the report to videotape not only the outside of the hospital to show the, the lines that we were seeing in the news, but also inside of the waiting room. And it was a completely different picture. The waiting rooms were empty. There was no yeah. line. There were no lines outside. Um, it, d does it seem like to you that, I mean, how could they, how could the news media get that so wrong? 
Oh man. And that's, you know, that's the difference between the medical industry that I was talking about who just think that we won't take things seriously enough if they don't really pump up the volume on it, but the media, Oh, that's a whole nother, a whole nother thing. It's, it's so deceptive. They, we talk about it all the time, but there's so much competition amongst media now to, to gather the ratings and the blog hits, which is what we measure as success. So you have to put out the most horrific news out there, worse than your counterparts. And it has to create the most panic. And so that, that example, that video was horrifying um, as a commentary on our state of news media. And I'll tell you, Merle, I wish that we can, and I don't, I, this is not well thought out, so I'm putting it out there for conversation. I wish that in order to get back to kind of the better days of when there was such a thing as journalistic integrity, that they had, there was a license that you, it could be revoked, you could be fined. And if, if you are found to be manipulating, do you remember that hurricane in that? And it would, this was funny, but there was somebody, a, a weather guy out there in the pouring rain and uh, the, the camera was way back on him and he's leaning like it, like he's about to be blown over, but he doesn't know it. But way in the background are two people in shorts and flip flops just standing there bullshitting. <laughs> Do you remember that? I did see that. Yes. <laughs> that was the funniest thing. The very, like within eight hours, these couple of college kids created a spoof video on that. And they're, they're, spraying this guy with a hose who's acting like that guy, that reporter, and they're throwing chairs at him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. But that's where our media is today. It's, it's accepted, and it shouldn't be accepted. That's what's bothersome. Well, and I think I like I like your idea, and at the same time, it's been used before uh, during the FDR administration. Uh, and and the, during that administration, they used the licensing practice. They they shortened the the FCC licenses down to a, a six month period, so that if the administration didn't like what you were you, you were talking about, if it was going against the new deal, they could revoke your license. So it, it, it caused the radio stations not to be able to be critical of anything that the, the administration was doing. So it's a slippery slope on either way. And I don't think there is an answer to this, but boy, I, 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 I like you wish that there were a way to, to stop this from happening. It seems as though all of the media is on the same page. We're not getting uh, conflicting views on the same thing anymore. We're getting the same view. And it seems like it's because most of the media is owned by a very Five. small number of people. Exactly. No, I totally agree. I hate to say it, man, but we are at a hard stop right now. So uh, uh, parting words, buddy. Hey, great conversation today. Really enjoyed yeah. it and uh, looking forward to the next one, Barry. And yeah. But happy Easter and happy Good Friday to everybody out there. I hope that uh, you find a creative way to spend time with your family. Just, you know, stay away from them. <laughs> yeah, don't get Zoom bombed. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll talk to you next week.